Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Monday's Wealth Creation Show. And today, we are going to be talking about how to build generational wealth. Now, Jim, this is something that's quite important to you. Um, and if you caught us at the weekend, we were talking about, obviously, we don't have all the answers, especially not when it comes to this, because we're talking about, you know, insurance, the right insurance policies and trusts in place and things as well. So it is kind of a, a learning together thing as well. So we don't always have all the answers, but it's good to go through things and look at the right avenues to follow to get the answers or speak to the right people. Um, so generational wealth, uh, one of these topics where you're still kind of implementing it in your own process. And if anybody's watching and it's something that they're um, obviously implementing and looking to do or have any information that might be useful, please join in and and, uh, and chip in the comments and things as well. We'll keep it interactive if we can. It, it depends as well what you deem as generational wealth, because generational wealth sometimes isn't just about um, money. Uh, now, let me give you an example of that, because yes. uh, I was actually watching uh, Richard Branson last night uh, and uh, HBO special about him, mm -hmm. about four, ep four episodes. I'm, I'm three in, and there's another a fourth one to go and his journey. Yeah. But he talks about generational wealth and he talks about it. So I, I tell you what, what is a crime is actually going to your deathbed and leaving all your skill to go with you. So everything yeah. you've learned, all the experiences you've had, all the wisdom you've gained and everything like that actually goes with you when you die. You've taught no one anything. The next generation hasn't benefited from any from anything that you've done or anything that you've learned as a result. And as far as he's concerned, as far as I'm concerned, actually, I've always believed that it's, it's a crime. Yeah. It's literally a crime to, to do that, um, to, to take all your knowledge with you that you've learned over all these years. The whole point is to allow the next generation to stand on the shoulders of giants. And now yeah. I'm not saying that we're giants, but the reality is if we all elevated the next generation up and held them up with what we've learned and passed it on to them as a result of that, then they would be a lot further ahead than us in terms of what they're doing. That's how most children today end up being in poverty for the rest of their life because no one's taught them anything. You know what happens next? is everybody goes, I think you should go through all the hard knocks that I've gone through myself. Yeah. Hello? And, ra and rather than rather than carrying on from where their parents left off, that it's like a reset button and they're having to start all over again. Yeah, the re they go back to the very beginning. Yeah. Think about that race. There's a great there's a great um, video online that actually um, amplifies, it, amplifies this. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a classic example about pe people from different backgrounds. Uh, the, you know, the white privileged kid gets gets the you know yeah. like 10 steps forward and then other people are determined that a step forward or steps back depending on where they've come from and what their background is and who they are and what their cultural beliefs are and also um what um, what position they are in terms of their socio-economic position as well and 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 then it, it shows straight away that the very fact that we all none of us start from the same starting point yeah we don't all start from the very beginning in a race or at the same point in time. And and but it also teaches you as well is you have to, you can't piss and moan about this. You have to you have to play the hand you've been dealt and make the best of what you've got rather than actually just rolling over and moaning about it for the rest of your life. This is what generational wealth is really all about. It's not about just money. It's about understanding where you are right now, learning from that. But it's also the people that are are mentoring you, which typically is your parents, yeah. or they're maybe not mentoring you, is helping you get that get further forward than them. The, the, if you're a parent, the thing that you, you should want most for your children right now is to be better off than you are. And I don't yeah. mean have the better car and I don't mean have the more flashy, bigger house. I mean, in terms of your wealth, which is your monetary aspect, not your income, it's your wealth of what you've got in order. In other words, can you retire tomorrow and never need to worry about ever money about ever again? If that is not the case, then that is that is not wealth. Wealth is what that is. Uh, can you do you know what to do when anything goes wrong? Do you understand the process about what you need to do next? If anything goes wrong, who you need to speak to, 
and all these different things. These are all things that your parents have probably gone through, but they're not passing that knowledge and information on as a result. Um, I took it for granted that most people knew how to work on a car because that's how I was taught. I thought, well, yeah. everybody just works on a car that they know, the carburation, the alternator, the, you know, the, the, the camshaft, the, the valves and, and, and everything like that. And, 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 people, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And and you ask most people working a car nowadays, it's like, I have no idea what you're talking yeah. about. And yet, I bet you their mothers or their fathers have actually worked on a car and they knew all that expert information, but they've never actually passed that knowledge and expertise on. That's yeah. the kind of thing I'm talking about, generational wealth. It's not just it's not money. money. Yeah, yeah it's what... not. Well, well, believe it or not, it is all about the money. <laughs> Because the money, the money will set you free ultimately. But it's everything you do in order to acquire that wealth and acquire that money is everything you've learned from everyone else round about you as a result of that. If you don't like where the youth of today are, it's your fault. Because when they were born, they weren't born with preconceptions about how to do everything, how the world was, and whether we had three or four different types of sexes. They never mm -hmm. acquired all that information. Where did they learn that from? Us. Yeah. Us. That's the only place they could have learned that from. Us. Not you personally, but but us. The people Society. Who are them, yeah, yeah they've, they've learned that from somewhere. And it, and it can't just be they've thought it up on the spur of the moment. That they've had, You have to learn that from somewhere. And that's another way of generational wealth, whether that's wealth or knows another story, being passed on the knowledge and information and, and expertise in a certain field and wisdom as well. That that's has to be what, and party that's what this is all about. Yeah, and that's what a big driver of this uh, the show itself, this, the Wealth Creation Show, for you, Jim, a big driver was you thought, God, and, and you've got so much that goes on in your head and so much that you, you know and that you do, and, and it's like, but how are you ever, ever going to get all that? And and so this is kind of like a bank of knowledge as well for, for your benefit and, and indeed generations to come. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you're right as well. Um, you touched on there about obviously we we will talk about it as we go through the challenges of building uh, generational wealth. And when I was researching this and putting together the pointers we're talking about, um, it obviously talks about people's initial beginnings and whether they come from a privileged background or whether it's you know if they're poor or if they've got financial yeah. backing or and it, and it also touched on about race and things as well. And you know these are all different factors. Um, that are challenges of generational wealth from where you start off and what your, what your starting point is. But mm -hmm. generational wealth in itself, so, I mean, it refers to predominantly, I suppose, obviously, assets passed down from one generation to the next. Building generational wealth can provide long-term financial security, opportunities for your children, your grandchildren, and, and beyond that, of course, as well. Um, and as you say, Jim, this is more than just financial resources. It's, uh, its value extends beyond the monetary aspect. It's also about imparting um, and enduring family values and wisdom and creating legacy and benefits uh, that shape the lives of your generations to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So today, uh, we're going to try and learn a wee bit more about why generational wealth is important, how to lay foundations uh, to build wealth for your family and how to ensure that their legacy is passed down and, and probably the most efficient ways um because obviously you, you get sidetracked and things could kind of snowball off um so we're going to try and cover as much as we can today and and as an open discussion guys i would say please if, if you have anything that you want to join in put it in the comments and we will we'll try and get to that as we go so let's talk about the the actual importance of building generational wealth um and as we see it's not all about the money but achieving financial success it's, that takes a lot of work, Jim, and, and sacrifice and planning, and and you covered that in your own journey and and uh, and the show and previous shows as well. Uh, but not only can it help you enjoy things in your lifetime, but it can also help your heirs or your or your obviously your your children and your grandchildren benefit from your legacy and enjoy financial security and a lifestyle after you've gone without having to, like you say, reset button and start again. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, for you, Jim, what, I mean, what, what's your views on, and what got you to the point where you thought, was it a light bulb moment when you thought, right, I'm going to think about 
passing this on and passing on this knowledge and passing on your, your obviously you've got your, your property portfolio and things as well and how what was when did you have a certain point in time or has it always been something that you thought this I need to make sure this is passed on correctly and people um, know what to do when I'm not here I think these are things that you just put, you just acquire over time about the continuous and continuous pursuit of knowledge but then but then you actually think to yourself and I, and, and and I have thought about over the years and, and I, I suppose it's other people round about you you get round about um, and mm -hmm. then they start to talk about these things as well and I think to myself God, think about all that knowledge and information it's just it's just lost i mean i've seen mm -hmm. it when you know when when people have known uh, who, who you know are, they're not exactly peers but they're people i know and i look up to have actually then passed away and i think to myself all the knowledge is gone it's just it's it's that's them, it yeah. it's gone it, it just dies with them and and i think to myself it's unbelievable you know the conversations you had i mean i used to i, I remember having the conversation with george now george was uh, George was actually um, um, a, a, an actual secret service spy <laughs> or something to that effect? He actually did wiretapping on people's phones, and when and you, George, you wouldn't say boot a goose, you know, George wouldn't say boot a goose to anybody. Um, he was really the the typical mild manner person, and he was he was you would never know that. And then when you mm -hmm. found out, it's like wait a minute, George, you were a spy. <laughs> it's like sorry, <laughs> it's like what you were. And then you think to yourself, it's like that. These stories, I think it's, I think it's a lot to do with these stories and the stories that you think that these people could have told. And this is why people are doing a lot of podcasts now and getting all this yeah. information out, which is fantastic. Uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, noise, white noise, I would say, in the ether there somewhere. Um, but you've got to filter out all the right stuff that you're getting, and it does mean aligning with the right podcasts. But the information and knowledge and expertise that people have and they can pass on, which is literally just free of charge. I know it's no free because you're spending your time having to listen to it. But if it can be listened to in time, which would otherwise be unproductive. In other words, if you're having a shower or having a bath or getting changed or, or getting up in the morning or driving in your car. I mean, the first thing I was taught was your car is a mobile university. Yeah. You should be listening to podcasts every single time you're in your car because that's unproductive time. And uh, and I, I can't remember it was Bob Proctor who used to say music is chewing gum for the mind. Yeah. <laughs> it's like or Zig Ziglar used to say that as well. Music's just chewing gum for the mind. Um, it's just nonsense. It's like you don't learn anything from it. Yeah, but it's maybe a bit too far when he said that because it's quite smooth and relaxing for a lot of people, and it can be good triggers to allow people to to build themselves up now and motivate again, and, yeah. and, and 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 motivate themselves. Um, but but it, but it's true. This is this is when you when you look at over over the whole lifetime that I've been so far, um, I kind of think you know I've just I've just come to that conclusion. Um, up to this point in time but it but it's a it's a learning process and the very fact is it's like you know it's taken me all that time to learn it where if somebody had actually worked this out well before me and actually got this in place and and talked about this this would have been an easier task mm -hmm. if, <laughs> this would have been a lot easier i would have learned this a lot quicker therefore i would have i would have thought to myself yeah this makes absolute sense but maybe that's a lot to do with point of readiness Maybe I just wasn't ready to hear that. Maybe it was all these people were running about me trying to impart yeah. their knowledge on me and share that knowledge with me. And as a result, I was going, well, what do you know? I get it from my kids right now. It's like, sorry? <laughs> what do you mean, what do I know? It's like, <laughs> really? <laughs> Are you having a laugh? Are you talking to the right person? It's like, <laughs> it's like, what do you know? You're just my dad. Uh, it's, you know, that sort of thing. But, but I tell you what, it's 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 mind blowing when you when you bring it into the context of I mean just people that you know. Andy Harrington actually said this to me once, and I remember it. It's quite profound when he says it. You know, there's there's at least a thousand people in the world that, that, that would pay money to know what you to know what you know. Mm -hmm. Out of the billions of people, would you be able to find a thousand people in the world that would pay money to know what you know? And I think the answer to that is yes. And it could be as simple as the fact that how did you manage to become a financial director from a stand and start from homeless and unemployed? Because I want to be a financial director so I could follow your path. See, it's as, as simple yeah. as that. How did you manage to become an accountant? Because I want to become an accountant, but I don't know where to start. 
how did you manage to become a property investor? Because I want to be a property investor, but I don't know where to start. How did you manage to buy a big portfolio? Because I don't know how to big, buy a portfolio of 30 properties, how, how that's done. So how did you manage to do that? Because I want to know that as well. See, it's all about what you want to know. And But yeah. everybody has that knowledge and information and expertise. How did you become a lettings director, Richard? These yeah. sort of questions. Because I want to become a, a, a director of lettings as well and a director of a company. So how do you do that? So... There's everybody's got information out there that they can pass on. How did you how did you become an alcoholic? And then how did you sober up and yeah. and stop being an alcoholic? Because people would pay money for knowing that information. People that are alcoholics right now that don't know how to stop. See all the knowledge and information and expertise and wisdom that everyone's got. And they don't realize how valuable that is to other people. You see that a lot in, uh, in America and things. It's quite a common thing where people that have struggled with addiction and been through hard times and turned their life around are now they now and they utilise it as an income stream because they go out as public speakers and speak to people and share their journey and how they turned around and you know and use that motivation positively and and they make a living out of it. Yeah, absolutely. See, see, so it's they make a living out of it and that's fine. But there's other people that actually just do it and they just do it out of the goodness of their heart mm -hmm. and yeah. impart their knowledge and expertise for other people to learn as a result of that. I'll be honest, this is exactly what we're doing right now. Yeah, in essence, yeah, of course it is. And, and not everybody will get this. Not everybody will understand it because it's not their point of readiness at this point in time. They're not, at the, they're not in the position to understand what's going on round about them because there's so much noise going on about in their life and yeah. other areas of their life. Therefore, they can't see it. You, you ever had the expression, you can't see the forest for the trees? Yeah. That's what it is. They're blind. They don't see what's going on because everything's in front of them right now. And they don't see what's past that as a result of that. And this is what, this is what, this is what, this is what generational wealth is really all about. It's the current generation and the generations before making sure they can pass on the knowledge and information and expertise that they've learned to allow the next generation to accelerate there quicker. Yeah, it's, it's a good place. And I was, we, we touched on it already. And it's, it's the, and a lot of people will probably think the same. It's like, well, I don't, I, I've not had that, any of that wisdom passed on. Or I mean, they feel like they're maybe just at a complete fresh, brand new start, but don't know how to start. And then, then obviously the challenges that they've had maybe financially or do you know their social standing or do you know how uh, people might have the question like how did i get myself from here to there or or start on this journey um yeah building your generational wealth and and everybody's different do you know everybody's come from different backgrounds like i see obviously somebody maybe have a better financial back end from parents or whatever somebody might not have any at all it might be a race thing it might be a cultural thing do you know what i mean there's lots of different factors so Everybody will be different from where they're, where they're starting. Point kind of and you've, you've kind of hit the nail on the head there as well about generational wealth, about teaching the next generation exactly mm -hmm. what they need to know. Um, the next generation maybe need to know that there's certain things that you shouldn't let hold you back. Mm -hmm. For example, where you came from. Yeah. What your ethnicity is. What your, what your, um, what your identity is. You shouldn't let that hold you back. But you notice in today's site, there's a lot of people that actually allow that to happen. They let that happen. Uh, you know, if I had, you sometimes learn something and you kind of think to yourself, I wish I had known that this happens to everybody. Because then I, then, then I, I would I would have, I would have, I would have been further forward right now, knowing what I knew. And, and I could maybe, I could maybe put a classic example of that as, you know, let's talk about your body, your knees. When yeah. you get past 50 and stuff like that, your body starts to degrade. Let's be honest. Your, Money's your, already gone. <laughs> aye, yet what happens is nature tries to find out ways to kill you off. Because literally, <laughs> as far as nature's concerned, when you get past 50 year old, you're beyond your productive lifestyle anymore. And therefore, let's start killing them off. And that's why you've got things like the menopause. That's why you've got things like, you know, all these different things that happen. That's nature's way of trying to, you know just kill you off because you're you're no longer productive anymore um as far as nature's concerned so that's what all these things are put in place but but there's there's people that have learned all these lessons beforehand to live a longer more productive life 
And it's actually that information that other people need in order to help them go uh, to, to overcome all these hurdles before they get there. In yeah. other words, people, you know, sometimes it's like, uh, you know, this happens to me and that's happening to me. And and it's like, I'm going through all these different things and they keep it all to themselves. I mean, you, let's, I mean, this is two guys talking about the menopause, but let's talk about it because <laughs> I, I know, I know I've been through it. My wife's been through yeah. it. And, yeah. and it's like, whoa, it's like from my point of view, it's like, oh, my God, scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but it literally is a, a whole different thing for, for women. It's like, yeah. oh, my God. But could you imagine? It's only they're now beginning to talk about it. You know, you've got people like Davina McCall and stuff like that talking about the menopause now. And they're saying, look, this is what happens. This is quite normal. And all the women in the world in, in the country are, 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 are listening to Davina McCall and they're going, Holy shit! I never came like, like that. Why didn't tell me that before? <laughs> I thought it was. I thought it was. I thought it was just yeah. me. And it's like, and now they're now they're open to the revelation. It's like, oh my god, this means I can just go and get help there. I can go get help there, and that means this can all be resolved quite easily. Rather than me having to suffer for the next twenty years, thing yeah. it's just me. See what I mean about information? How it can be how it can be beneficial from other people's lesson that they've learned to impart it for the next generation so they can understand that information quicker and know what to do about it. That is what is generational wealth is all about, passing that knowledge and information mm -hmm. on. And that's a great example of, of that exactly right now. And and for guys as well, it's like, you know, the fact that I used to watch, I mean, I'm going to talk about toiletry habits again. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but it's guys, it's like when you get older, it's like, oh, my God, I have to work out my I have to work out my travel based on the number of toilet stops I can get on the way. Because <laughs> everything just doesn't work as it used to work before. You, yeah. you, you could no longer stop mid P and stuff like that. <laughs> it's like you've just, got, you've just got to work it out. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm needing the toilet. How did I not know that? <laughs> That's what happens when you get older with your body. But but guys didn't didn't talk about that either. I mean, I used to see some old guys standing at the urinal for about flimming about twenty years. <laughs> it's like, are you not finished yet? It's yeah. like I'm just hit and run. That's it. I'm off. And it's like yeah, they that, stand that, there for that, ages and ages and ages. And I thought, why the hell are they standing there for ages and ages and ages? And it was only when I got to this, then realised yeah. why they're standing there for ages and ages and ages. <laughs> yeah. And if somebody had maybe made you aware of that, then you would know that, that oh, I've got that to come. And it's the same like you see with the menopause. If, if women are now aware of this and what to do and things, they could then speak to their daughters about it. So their daughters, when they get to that time in their life, won't be like, whoa, what's going on here? This isn't normal. Is this just me? Or, yeah. I suppose it, it's it's education. It, it's really yes. it's education. It's uh, it's 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 education overall, and it's understanding that, and it's and it's making sure that's imparted to the next generation, so they can be it can benefit them as a result. Notice at this point in time, we've not really talked anything about money when we talk about generational wealth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about passing on knowledge. Mm. Yeah, definitely. But then people might think, right? Okay, well generational wealth and, and if, if people that are watching you now obviously we predominantly talk a lot about uh, property investment and things as well people might think well but I'm, I'm trying to think about my financial side of things to leave um for obviously my generations to come but they're like well they might think well how am I going to start to, how am I going to start there I don't know where to start and I've just shown me how to start and then that's all about maybe building like a strong financial foundation for yourself and yeah you could start anywhere Jim and, and I think you you'll uh, testify to that fact that you can start really anyway. You just need to look at obviously your own situation in terms of maybe I don't know if you've got savings or start saving or you know, having an emergency fund. Matter. And it it really debt. doesn't matter where you are at this point in time. I've known people that have been uh, down and out on the street, yeah. that have picked themselves up, dusted themselves off, and built built huge amounts of wealth as a result of that. You know, just monetary wealth because because they've just they've just got themselves mm -hmm. together. They've understood that this happens to everybody, and but they've not they've then not had a pity party, and 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 got other people to have a pity yeah. party with them, and round about them. So they're all mm, 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 it's me, you know, sucking their thumb, and it's like, oh, mm, mm, why me? It's like, no, yeah. just get that out of your mind, and, and it's having the right mentors in order to in order to get them there. I, I was so fortunate 
over 30 years ago to meet the right mentors at the time and be introduced to these people because then they started to teach me all these things at the very beginning and teach me all the fact that, you know, and the, the fear that I had and more or less they instilled that into me. Now you could say that's, oh my God, they still fear into you. Well, it, was, it wasn't that. It was, I'm still fearing to myself for the very fact that, you know, when I eventually had children, I mean, I think I had Tony at that time anyway, but Tony was extremely young at that time. I think she was still maybe two years old or something like that. Um, but, but the fear of when Tony grows up, I will not be able to afford anything for her um, at that point in time. So it was like, you know, for university education, for things like, you know, gen you know, um, pensions, it went, all these things, it never happened at once, but it was just a realization over time that your your children aren't going to be as well off as you are. I'll guarantee yeah. you that for a start, um, because they're going to have to more or less fend for themselves, because the state isn't going to be in a position to look after anybody anymore. If you knew that, if you knew that was, if you saw that coming, um, and the classic example about, you know, um pissing your life up against the wall and just living for the weekend and and just just you know spending all your money as you have it every single day thinking that when you get into your elder elderly years that somebody else is going to look after you is a is a, is a pretty naive conclusion yeah and the fact that even and and then even worse for your children coming to you later on and saying look i really want to go to university and then you turning around and saying I didn't really have enough money for you to go to university. I can't really afford that. Um, uh, maybe you should just get a job like everybody else. Y you know, see what I mean? And then then yeah. them, them being exactly in the same position as you are, living from hand to mouth, with, with no month, too much month at the end of the money. They've literally run out of money and they're not knowing what to do. I've, I've been in the, I've been in the mire. I've been in there already yeah. and it's no great. You know, having to, you know, I was I, I smoked at that time, and it was like having to rake the ashtrays to see if you can find some doubts that you can get a roll up out of because you had no money for cigarettes. Um, having to scrape the bottom of the barrel and raid your we, you know, your two penny jar that you were putting all your loose change in just to go out for a pint. It's you know that's that's no great position to be in. Having to live on bloody crispy pancakes for the rest of your life because you couldn't afford anything else. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I like that's, a crispy pancake, but... <laughs> but this crispy, aye, it'll, it'll also kill you, though, at the same time. Yeah. that You know, eventually they'll catch up on you for that poor dietary requirement, yeah. and, and and eventually you'll probably die of cancer, more than likely, because they're, they're not that good for you. Um, oh, I think highly pro, ultra, ultra processed food high ultra processed food is, is let's be honest it's carcinogenic at yeah. some point in time it'll catch up with you because it's like drinking it's like drinking arsenic every single day a wee bit of it at some point in time it'll accumulate and you will die as a result of it yeah and that's what we do every single day with our bodies when we're when we're consuming um you know a highly processed ultra processed food. foods yeah. yeah i mean processed foods is all right that's like your what your mum used to make the chutneys and the the jams yeah. and everything like that you know, that's processed, you know, that's fine. But highly ultra processed foods is the stuff you buy at the supermarket, which is pre-packed food. And it's got yeah. all the all the ingredients in it to the preservatives, the additives and everything like that. You know, beware if you see anything that's like, you know, plant-based or, yeah, or nature's or, nature's goodness or something like that. This is just all crap. They're trying to smoke in mirrors to get I you a bit of a really long shelf life as well. Um, when I look at some things, I'm like, how could that still be okay at that, at, at that date? And that's because it's got so much preservatives and things in it. Of course it is. You see yeah. vegan cheese. You can leave vegan yeah, cheese outside it. forever. Vegan cheese you could leave outside forever. Because I'm a vegan. You can leave no. that vegan cheese outside forever. And not not one insect will go near it. And it'll never, ever go off. It is literally just like eating plastic, if you, if you look at it like that. And that's the same with most high, highly ultra-processed foods. You know, it tastes nice and it's nice as a one off, and I have it as well. And it's nice mm. with your baked potato and your beans and all the rest of it, but not all the time. It's not, not time, good yeah. for you. Um, th again, this is generational wealth, this is past knowledge and information yeah. and, and, and all the rest of it on to the next generation. So, we're, we've talked about money, we're talking about health now, we're talking about knowledge and expertise and passing it on. Um, these are all things that you've got to, if you learn quickly, you can adapt quickly to your current situation and you will be in prime position later on to take advantage of any opportunities that come across as a natural result of what you're doing. Yeah, I think 
I mean, it's just, and if you've got a family and generational wealth and things is something that you're you're trying to obviously implement into your strategy, it's really important to involve your kids in your conversations and not just about money, but also about just general things in life and, and imparting that wisdom onto them so that they know um, when they when they embark on things in their own in their own right. Yeah. And not so so them. when we get down to the brass tacks of the money aspect, this is why mm-hmm. we need to start. This is why you need to start early. For anybody yeah. that has children, the day they are born, take out a pension for them. Yeah. Sorry? You get pensions straight away for children when you're born? Absolutely. You can get private pensions taken straight out. You're the trustee for the pension. You oversee it till they're 16 years old. But everybody can put money aside for them, like savings, and, and you know when they get stuff, when they get money at Christmas, when they get yeah, money at uh, birthdays and stuff yeah. like that. When they get money when they're born, that could be put into a pension straight away, and up to the up to the basic rate allowance. The government actually gives you the tax back for a child, mm-hmm. for a child. It's like, oh my god. I thought you had to wait till you started work or you were, at a, you were at 18 years old before you got a pension. No, you can start a pension anytime you want. You can start a pension for your children anytime you want. And the compounding effect is absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. You're talking about when your children retire just on the basic 2,880 every single year you put in. When your children retire after 50 years of putting 2,880 in a pension, uh, then they're literally going to be a multimillionaire on their retirement. Now, that means you could just put in less than that. But your aunties and uncles can all put money into that pension on behalf of your children at any time they like. So that's a really good one. And that gives them a solid financial foundation to build on later on. Yeah. So if it doesn't go according to plan when they're when they're you know throughout their life, at least they've got at least they're, at least they're safe and at least they're secure later on in life. And they could retire at 55 years onwards. So you're still allowed to retire 55 years onwards, regardless of what the government says at 67, because that's just the state pension, remember? Yeah. You can retire at 55 onwards anytime you like when you're 55 and you've got the adequate amount of money and the adequate pension. So you can have great options here. It'd be brilliant to have the options. Could you imagine when you get to 55 and you'll still be, you'll still have your health, you'll still have your fitness, if you looked after your body, by the way, and if, to, if you've no, you know, constantly drank all the time and ate all the wrong crap and smoked and everything. Um, if you've done that and you've looked after yourself, uh, then you'll be in a position at 55 year old to have a great lifestyle after that, especially if you have a pension. You, you you don't need to work ever again. You could just volunteer and do everything and you could travel the world if you want, if you've got the right amount of money. Because remember, what stops you from retiring? It's not age. No. It's money. Yeah, it's, it's enough money to survive. If you had the money, you could retire at 20 year old if you want. Retire at 15 year old if you want. And just never work again if you want. You just do everything you want to do anytime you want to do it. So there's nothing to do, nothing stopping you except money. That's why I went back to saying everything really comes back to money. It's right up there with oxygen, by the way. Yeah. Because if you want anything done and you want anything done quickly, and because 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 you're having to wait for stuff, then I tell you what, beating it to death with a bag of money sorts it all the time more than likely. That's no massy. That's Bill O'Brien. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and some Everybody people might some, some people might disagree, but um, I, I agree that you're right. Aye, most people will disagree. I'll be in poverty. Yeah, <laughs> I'll guarantee you that most people that disagree with what I'm saying right now will be struggling to make ends meet because they don't want to know the truth. Mm-hmm. Because the truth then highlights the fact that what they fail to do as a result of what they're doing. This is a this is a tough this is a le- this is a tough lesson to learn. This, you know, this is tough love um, when it comes down to it. And, and if my future generations, my family are seeing this, you know, this is this is tough love. Um, nobody's going to do it for you, by the way. You've got to get out there and do it yourself. So it's all about making sure you look after yourself, look after your body and make sure you invest for the future. This is key here for a lot of people. I'll guarantee you, out everybody listening to this and watching this, even later on as well, only 5% of you will do this ever. And the reason for that is because that's the way the world works. You've just got to decide if you're going to be in the 5%, I would say. So start, start prioritizing, start putting money aside, start prioritizing your wealth and your savings and all the rest of it, making sure you've got some money left over and enjoy yourself. It's no all like it's no all like doom and gloom until you hit 55, <laughs> living in the poverty line and 
It's like, oh no, we're going to no spend this, and it's like we're going to keep this and, and squirrel it away. And it's like because because some people might get to fifty five, and that might be the end of them. You know, yeah. they might pop their clogs just by nature's the way nature works. Right. Yeah. That's that really. So these are all the things. These are all the things that happen to you as a result, and you just have to take them on board. But but enjoy yourself while you're here. Definitely, I would say, enjoy yeah. yourself while you're here. But look after yourself and plan for your future. Definitely, I would say. So prioritize your savings. Build an emergency fund as well. I love emergency funds. Yeah. Yeah. You always have an emergency fund. You know, it's definitely emergency funds are really important because you can dip into that when you need it. Classic example. I really need a break right now. I want to go on holiday. Have I got the money to do it? I have. But I think most people probably wouldn't have the money to do that, to go on a holiday at the drop of a hat. I think most money, most people wouldn't have the option to do that because maybe they're tied into what they're doing. Maybe maybe they're happy having a boss who tells them what to do every single day and the fact that they kind of do what they want to do when they want to do it. But it'd be nice to have that financial freedom and that financial security. So if you decide that you want to do something, then you go and do it as a result. Yeah, an emergency fund is really important. I like, well, for exactly what it says, in the event of an emergency, if something uh, comes up and you need to pay for something. But it's also, and we spoke about this in the past, no one's ever got complete certainty. What if you were to lose your job tomorrow? Um, would you be able to survive for the next month or two? Do you have enough yeah. savings or, 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 or emergency fund to keep you going? Uh, and if you've got a family and things, and the answer to that is no, then that's maybe not the best situation to be in. If this is what I was always told by my mentors, if your income is based on your ability to perform, yeah. you're in trouble. Because I tell you what, at some point in time, you'll maybe get COVID and you're out of the game because you've maybe got it that bad. You'll maybe you'll maybe break your leg and you're required to drive for your work. So you can't do anything else because you're maybe a taxi driver, for example. Your income's wiped out. You'll maybe need your hands because you're a surgeon Mm -hmm. and you end up cutting your hand and it's it's a laceration and therefore you can't perform surgery anymore. You're out of the the game. You're maybe a pilot and it relies on you passing your health test every single time. And maybe that time you've not passed it because you're not healthy enough to, to fly. Your income is wiped out. It's over. Yeah. That's why emergency funds are so important. Yeah, and the thing is, without your emergency fund, it then puts you in that position where if you're if an emergency occurs or you lose your job or whatever, then that pushes you to end up being in debt to try and then survive, and then debt, and it could cause people maybe to sell up their investments and you know make decisions like that, which then will leave them in a position where um, they they maybe incur penalties on on loans and things they can't pay back. Yeah, um, I think avoiding debt, avoiding debt, debt, debt cost thing as well. Avoiding debt, financial pitfalls, everything like that, you know, that's the sort of things you want to do. Um, You don't want to really take on too much debt. If you have got debt right now, you want to attack the ones with the highest interest rate to get rid of them, because that's obviously the ones eating into your into your wealth overall. Now, when I talk about wealth, maybe your wealth is a negative, maybe your negative 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000. But Mm -hmm. you can come back from that quite easily at some point in time. So that's the sort of things to do. Um, you said it before, Richard, about involving money conversations uh, with your children. I mean, I've tried to talk to my children. It's like try, try to talk to a brick wall sometimes. But 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 they, they kind of know. They've got the gist there. I mean, they're saving money. They're putting money away in their pension. Um, they've got uh, the ISAs, the lifetime mm-hmm. ISAs yeah. and stuff like that. They're, they're doing the first home fund where you get, you know, you get X percentage after five years towards the purchase of your first house. They're no daft. It's like when I spoke to them, you know, originally about, you know, I want to go to Dundee University. I'm like, mm, that's going to cost an absolute fortune. Would you know about it? just going to Fife College and just driving along there every single day? Because you could do the same course. It's like, oh, I never thought about that. And it's like, that's that's what they did. So they didn't see the point of spending all that money and going living in digs to just to just to do that, if they can do it locally as well. And then you can take that money, you can invest that money, you can use it for something else. So it's it's starting that. And and the classic example is how I first started as a child was Monopoly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got introduced to Monopoly and I wanted to be the king at playing Monopoly. And then I, I every single time. But the thing is, I never read the rules. 
<laughs> it took me years to un if I just read the bloody rules, I would have got there quicker. See what mm -hmm. I mean about knowledge yeah. and expertise. If I read the rules, I would have understood Monopoly quicker. I would have been successful at the game quicker. And I would have probably got involved in buy-to-let investment a lot quicker as well. Because that's what spurred me on to do it. Because I was understood completely. This was all about acquiring as much property as quickly as possible. And then starting charging everybody for rent. Raising enough income. Then buying even more property as a result. And then just keeping doing that. That is what Monopoly taught me. Yeah. So... These sort of things are, are, are definitely, um, uh, you know, the things to go for. And then what happened next was investing in my education. Mm -hmm. I've spent, I've spent well over a hundred thousand. Well, actually, a lot more than, <laughs> even more than a hundred thousand. Maybe, maybe two or three hundred thousand over the over the last thirty years of my education. You know, I'm no short of, you know, going someplace. I mean, we went to, for example, in the state agency, we went to America. Yeah. Um, to learn from some of the best estates in America in the, early, in the late 10s, you know, 2009, 2010. 2011. It was 2011. And then I continued to do stuff like that as well, but obviously over to Paris to meet um, and, and spend the weekend with Keith Cunningham, Rich Dad, and then over Tony Robbins. Um, we've been down there, uh, Leaders yeah. Summit, um, you know, well, um, UPW, um, Unleash the Power Within, several times for me. So all these different people and 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 then learn how to write books, learn how to public speak, thousands and thousands. I'm talking real thousands, tens yeah. of thousands to do all this. Um, but I saw that as essential because that acquisition of knowledge and information will help me um, accelerate my performance a lot quicker as a result of what I do. So I invested in the right things, but sometimes I invested in the wrong things and it never paid off. So it was a lesson not to do that again. Which you could then pass on. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, don't do that for God's don't sake, because do I've done it and it doesn't work. So that's the that's the most important thing. And then comes property investment, which is which is we, we all everybody wants to invest in property. Let's be honest. I mean, yeah. for the, even these people, even these people that can't invest in property want to invest in property. But what they do is they just want to get at everybody else that's investing in property because they can't. Let's yeah. be honest. All these people on living rent and stuff like that, all these platforms, all the <laughs> all the tenant groups and everything, these people really want to invest in property, but they can't. And they just want to have a go at everybody else that does, just because it, it highlights their failure. Well, that, that which is a shame because anybody can, as long as you know the right people to help you get a, a, a start. Yeah, of, of course. Yeah. I, I remember, I'm not going to have any political career out of this, by the way. <laughs> Because yeah. <laughs> these sort of things will get cast up later on if I was ever a politician. But I'm not bothered. <laughs> yeah. I am not owned and controlled by anybody. That's the yeah. that's the other thing I wanted to be. I never wanted to be owned or controlled by anyone. And that meant financial freedom was essential. And so nobody so you can become almost untouchable. And I don't mm -hmm. mean in a, in a criminal sense. I mean no. just in a financial sense that the fact that nobody can pull your strings because your money and your income is not based on what they do for you as a result of that. So that's why I got into property investment. Um, but then again, it's all about creating and preserving assets and building wealth um, over a period of time. And that's why I started. So you start small and you just build up over time. There's so many people that jump into property investment. They go on a course um, for the first time ever and they think they should be buying a portfolio of 10 or 20 properties straight away. And I'm like, are you delusional? No, you need to start. Because that ain't going to happen. And maybe you've got one person in the whole of Britain has maybe been able to do that. And the whole that out on the course is the, is the benchmark. But that's no, that's no possible. We've all got a different journey to follow and a different journey to take. Um, and you have to play the hand you've been dealt with. If you've got no money and no resources, no wealth, you ain't buying a portfolio of 30 properties or 20 properties or 10 properties. No. You're scraping the bottom of the barrel until you could buy one property and do it up all yourself, learn from that, buy the next property, do it up all yourself, remortgage it out, do it again, yeah. remortgage out, do it again. You're just going to have to go the hard school of knocks like everybody else went. But that's what people don't realize is they give up, but they don't realize is all the successful property investors have done that. They've yeah. all trodden that path every single time. They've paid their dues. Newsflash, 
you're going to have to pay the price. Whoever's tuning in here, you are going to have to pay the price. And I don't know what that price is you're going to have to pay, but it's going to be hefty, more than likely. It ain't going to fall into your lap. You're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to be smart. You're going to have to team up with the right people. You're going to have to learn from everybody. You're going to have to grind like everybody else and what you're doing. It's not coming to you for nothing. You ain't buying 30 properties portfolio just because you've been on a course with some furu out there. Um, it's just not going to happen for you. Just accept reality. Yeah. However, be prepared for the opportunity just in case it comes up. But just don't get delusions of grandeur. In other words, thinking you're, it's all going to happen for you overnight. And if it doesn't happen for you overnight, oh my God, I'm a failure at this. Yeah. I'm going to go and get a job. And I'm just going to work for someone else for the rest of my life. Up, just yeah. work for someone else for the rest of your life and do your side hustle anyway and build your property portfolio mm -hmm. at the same time. That's what most people do. And some people take it to the nth degree, like I did, and allowed them to, to leave their job. Um, so these are all the things. And this is all coming back to building the plan. You have to plan. You have to start somewhere. I got a bit of pen and paper, and I wrote in the pen and paper, if I buy one property, it's going to be it's going to be this amount. Like at that time when I was buying property, it was 15 grand. Yeah. <laughs> it's like 15 grand? What? And 10,000 pounds for a property, a flat. <laughs> but in today's terms, with the amount of income that everybody earns, it's probably the same in real terms. Um, if not, just probably actually a bigger price in real terms. Because you can buy flats still, like 50 and 60 grand, 70 grand. Mm -hmm. um, but... 30 years ago, they were 10, 15 grand, and I was buying them for that. And I was getting, a, and, and then I worked out how much rent I'm going to get for this property on the bit of paper. And then I worked out, okay, that's what it'll give me every year. So, how much I deposited, I need to buy my 10 and 15 grand property. Well, at that time, I think it was 10% you were allowed away with. So, it's like, okay, I only need one and a half grand profit. So, if I make a thousand pounds that year in that property, I've got a thousand pounds left after my overheads, right? Now, 30% was assumed over it. Notice how I still I have that model today and it worked perfectly. That, yeah, on the 30%. Yeah. And then I do all the side hustles, so I minimise that. So I'm actually a higher margin. And therefore, I go, okay, can I buy another property with that money? I've just made out of this one. No, I've got to pay tax on it. Right, okay. So it might take me two years of that with that one property to get that next property for the deposit. So two years time passes, I've made £2,000 and therefore what comes along is like, oh, I need 1500 quid for my next property. So then I go and buy another property with that 1500 quid I've made over the two years. So mm -hmm. in, in, in three years time, I've got two properties now. And then I've got £1,000 out of that one every year in profit. So now I've got £2,000 every year. Oh, wait a minute. The next year I can buy one more property. So next year in year four, I've got three properties now. No, I've got ah, I've got three properties. So see, year yeah. four, oh, I've got a thousand pounds. So I've got thousand pounds. So I've got three thousand pounds coming. But property prices have moved up a bit, so I can only buy one property again. So the following year, I buy another property. But see how I'm just acquiring them over time. Yeah, it momentum, yeah. I've still got my side hustle with my job, so I'm still living day to day, and I've still got a, a, a decent lifestyle because I've still got my side hustle, and this is working in the background. So when I started putting this and mapping this all out and 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 doing that. I then went, I then worked out how many I would have after 20, 30 years or 50 years. And then I went, OK, how could I accelerate this quicker then? That's when I started to work out. That's the plan. That's when I started yeah. to work out, OK, can I get more? Can I get a deposit quicker? Ah, wait a minute. I'm actually getting more money now because I've now gone from a trainee accountant to a section leader, to a supervisor, to a financial controller, to a financial director. It's like, oh, I could leave my lifestyle exactly where I am right now and I could just take that extra money and put it into buying more property so I can accelerate this quicker. Not See how that works? Yeah. That's how you build a plan. And then you start to minimise things like your tax. You start to realise things on on things like uh, tax relief on personal contributions to... Uh, I'm doing yeah. it right now. Okay. I just got to say, Jim, you do that, yeah. Uh, well, I've basically put the full allowance in this year, the 60 grand to my pension. Because I want to take advantage of all these different mm -hmm. things. And I've done it in different ways in terms of what I've done. But it's only because I'm coming towards the end of my, technically I could just draw my pension down now. But I kind of think I want, I now want to build that as well as have my property portfolio. I just don't want to can keep plowing it all into property 
because if I plow it into property, I then have to pay a lot more tax on it. Yeah. Because I've got to take it out to put it in. But if I put it into my pension, it's a nice tax efficient wrapper. So that's why I'm using my pension in order and personal contributions in order to do that. And then I start to optimize my investment choices. So it's it's thinking about the things that you want to do. Do I want to really change that onto a SaaS? Is, does a SaaS make sense? So mm -hmm. it's things I've got to learn about still in the learning process in order in order to move on. Um, I, I mean, if people have got their own pensions, they've got their workplace pensions, you it's should really put your workplace pensions as well. So if you've got a workplace pension right now, look at the small print because some employers actually actually match beyond the normal requirement is what you put in as to what they put in. Some employers do that as a just a, a wee additional benefit because they can they can get a tax benefit on it and it actually keeps you with them as well because you're getting good contributions. I actually bumped into somebody at work that's, well, I was actually running well in the Edinburgh Marathon, his mm -hmm. Scottish Widows, and he was talking about his pension. And he says, I was thinking about leaving Scottish Widows. And I said, so what's your pension contributions then? And he went, well, I'm putting in that. I says, what's, what's Scottish Widows putting in? And he went, oh, 12% of my salary. And I went, sorry, 12%? <laughs> it's like, what? And you're thinking about leaving Scottish Widows. So you're getting a cheap mortgage and you're getting 12% pension get contributions yeah. from your employer. You're off your head. No, it's right. like just take your money and do a side hustle with property at the same time and build a portfolio, get a letting agent to look after it and make hay while the sun shines. Yeah. Why would you want to change that? The five things that are most disruptive, I know, I'm, I'll see if I can remember them. Getting married, starting a new job, buying a house, uh, divorce, and, uh, and, and probably death or something like that, or separation. Um, yeah. Well, that's divorce, isn't it? Divorce. But, but there's but there's about five things that will make a difference in your life, and I tell so you, what, help, you, you want to, I don't know, but you want to minimise these ones as much as possible. Moving house and changing a job, two of the most you know things that take most of your mind away. Don't move house till you can afford it, for God's sake. Yeah. But but afford it as in time, and also if it, if it's going to divert you from your from your ultimate goals, don't move house. Yeah, it's like just stay where you are. The amount of people I've seen, and I've got, oh, for God's sake, I wouldn't be moving if I was you. You're off your head. It's like, what? You're an estate agent. You're supposed to want to sell my no, house. But a lot it's of like, people no. will move because they want to, not because they need to. Yeah, it's only because you, you move because you have to, not because you want to. I want a bigger house so I can show off to everybody else. I'll piss off. It's like, yeah. didn't be stupid. That's crazy talk. It's like mm -hmm. that's gonna that's gonna cost you a fortune. That's gonna be a huge mortgage that you're gonna have more than likely because you ain't buying that for cash, and that's a huge liability that you've got to spend as yeah. a result of that. Don't, for God's sake, if you've got your plans on your financial future and actually retiring earlier, having even I'm not even saying the retiring. I'm not expecting people to retire. I retired technically at 38, but I still continue to work because I love what I do. But I have a, I have a, I, I, I love it every single day because I can, I can just get up and say, tell you what, I just didn't want to work the day. Yeah. I still earn money. Well, I mean, I've earned money in the time that we just spoke. I've not even done anything. It's like it's all passive in terms of what we're doing. It's like that's how powerful that is. So yeah. utilize all these things: tax advantages, workplace pensions, you know, all these different things. Your employer contributions. So check your employer's small print because some employers will give you more beneficial. Um, benefit salary sacrifice yeah. you know if I, if I sacrifice some of my salary well you put that into my pension I'll get a bigger pension as a result of that because I'm coming near my end of my end of my career it's like th 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 that could make sense for you so these are all but speak to professional advisors as a result of that but I'll be honest my take on speaking to professional advisors here it is you write down your net worth and I'll write down my net worth and if you're worth more than me I'll listen to what you've got to say. That's effectively yeah. how I do things. If, if somebody comes to me as a professional advisor, it's right. Unless unless it's specialist knowledge that I don't have, and I think I need to learn from you, and I need to learn what you're doing, and it makes sense to do that, then yes, I'll take your I'll take your advice. But I'll, but I'm not taking their advice. I'm actually just taking the knowledge and information, and I'm saying okay, 
I'm putting, I'm, I'm giving me myself my advice based on what I've learned from them. That's how I'm doing it with a financial, when a financial person. So there's very few financial. I don't really speak to a financial planner. I get people phone them up, but yeah, it's no good. Just falls on deaf ears. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the sort of thing you've got to think about as so we're as we're nearing the end of this. Um, yeah, so, I think as you've went through, obviously from the beginnings and and how how you obviously build your your own obviously um, financial journey and 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 build yeah. your assets and and go through that whole learning process and then obviously if you've got these assets and things ultimately people are going to be asking like well how do we how do we pass these down how do we pass down my general uh, generational wealth how do we do that? and this is something that you've been exploring yourself jim um recently um about the right way to actually do that and the right way to leave your legacy and leave your, your assets and things so that they are uh, not uh, affected by anything else why you're not there and they could still be passed down from not just your kids but your grandkids and things as well well, first of all, um, you've definitely got to do some sort of will, I would say. Yeah. Um, we've got a will. We've also got power power of attorney. And in case mm -hmm. I'm up a mountain and there has to be decisions made and I'm up a mountain and they have to go to the bank and sort things out or yeah. anything like that. So they've got power of attorney. Um, the kids have a power of attorney for us as well. Um, and it's in the safe. Um, and they, we've also got a will, which obviously says everything goes to the children in three ways. But I yeah. don't think that will is adequate enough. So I'll need to well I'll need to revise that now because that was done. So if you've not got a will, for God's sake, do it now. Even yeah, though you're yeah. about thirty year old, if you've got children uh, or even if you've got a partner, you need to have a will because I tell yeah. you what, you'll be you'll be locked up in probate for ages trying to get this over the line if anything happens to you. So yeah. it's it's you're actually doing everybody else a, a, an injustice if you don't have a will, no matter what age you are. So something, anything is better than nothing when it comes yeah. to this. Um, the, the, that's the very basic level. Um, you, if you, you can go more complex than that, and you can go into things like trusts, for example. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I've still not worked out what trusts are in, in essence. Now, in accountancy and taxation, I learned about trusts um, when I was at college um, studying my diploma in accountancy and my professional exams as well. Uh, and I know trusts are highly taxed at quite a high level, but there yeah. are good investment vehicles, I know, in the face of it, if you get the right trusts, um, in order to pass on wealth, um, and it's not taken into account in, in inheritance tax then. Yeah. So if you have trusts, it doesn't get taken into account in inheritance tax, but they do have a hefty tax bill every single year as a result of what you do. Plus, I think there's something like after 150 years passes, the trust ends. Um, but I've been assured that, well, I'd be dead, wouldn't I? Um, but but I've been assured that after 150 years it just renews again and goes on to be yeah. the trust again. But um, I've still uh, I've still probed that. I wouldn't have like putting all my stuff and then realizing my generations of kids to come in 150 years, then it all just stops. Yeah. And there's nothing that... there's nothing there. Or does it get returned back to the the people? Um, it actually the trust was bene were beneficiaries for. So these are all the things I've still got to work out myself and learn about the trusts. Um, I was going to say, that's, a, that's an educational learning thing for, for you and anybody that's obviously it's not, not a public familiar. record thing to you and and mm -hmm. it's difficult to understand that but i know I, I, i'm quite slyly like i look up people's accounts and i start to realize um you know people are just as wealthy as me if not more wealthy than me yeah in the property fit in the property sector they've got llps and they've got companies involved in the llps as well as ownership and i'm thinking well, right. i wonder why they're doing that limit liability partnerships by the way yeah. um I wonder why they're doing that. So I need to learn from these people. So at some point in time, I will touch base with them. I'm actually speaking to somebody this afternoon, John Howard. Um, I'm going to meet, meet up with him. We're going for lunch. Uh, John was on Property Elevator with Simon Zushi, um, yeah. who is a developer. Now, John has bought and sold over 3,000 properties himself. Um, so he's pretty knowledgeable in terms of that. So we're, we're meeting up after this. Hence the reason I'm speeding up in here and, and <laughs> finishing off because I need to get yeah. over and see him and take him for lunch. Uh, but he's up here from London. Um, right. he's got a site he's i think it's 34 homes that i was looking at he got them and uh, that's how that's how i knew of them so we're meeting up um, after this okay. um so it's it's all about learning these sort of things because john's going to have a great amount of knowledge as well and how to pass on his generational wealth because he's not just going to leave it all and spend it all and and no no be tax efficient in terms of what he's doing so once you've got your affairs in order and all the rest of it, you've got lines of communication with your family, yeah. um, you need to kind of let everybody know what your plans are in terms of what you're doing. And I've just kind of started to think about that. 
Um, and I'm just at that cusp where I'm thinking about that right now, about who do I need to sit down? If anything happens to me, do I need to get Tony to oversee this? Do I need to make sure she's trained? Because she's an accountant as well. Yeah. Um, um, and she's trained that way. So maybe she's the best person to actually sit down and say, this is what I do on a weekly basis. This is what I do on a daily basis. It's nothing encumbering. Just keep an eye on these KPIs, these figures, and you'll you'll be quids in. It'll mm -hmm. just run like it should do. And when you get to this point, maybe you should think about buying more property for the fund and, and, and building it up like that um, over a period of time and not actually taking all the money out at once because then it's taxable and how to take it out tax efficiently with dividend income between you and your two brothers. Um, that sort of thing. And then when another set of family comes along and they're passing along, hopefully that knowledge and information and expertise will okay, pass to them as well as a natural result. So the bottom line, first generation wealth builder, yeah. committing to those first steps to save money, build the emergency fund, start to invest for the long term, follow through with consistency, it'll eventually pay off. Yeah. It takes a lot of sacrifice, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of work, takes a lot of information, takes a lot of continuous learning, but over a period of your lifetime, I have noticed everybody that started 20 years ago in anything have now become super wealthy 20 years later because mm -hmm. they stuck at it and they left it as their core business, their specialization. Whatever mm -hmm. that is, you'll see that every single time. Everybody, everybody has done 20 years in the same thing, has become so successful at what they're doing because they've 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 made it their specialization, just like an athlete does and trains every single day for that. So pass on these knowledge and insight to your grandchildren and everything. Uh, key takeaways. Richard, I am away. I'll leave you with the key takeaways way to talk yeah, about that. You. And thank you every, to everybody uh, else for tuning have in. Good, have a good meeting. Uh, Richard's going to finish off. And bye-bye uh, for now from me. That's great, Jim. Yeah, key takeaways for today, guys. I think, obviously, the generational wealth really refers to passing down your assets from one generation to the next. And uh, before you could build your generational wealth, start creating that real strong financial foundation, prioritizing your saving, growing your emergency fund, um, and thinking about your future plans as well. So, I mean, generational wealth can provide really long-term financial security, and it can open up the, all the opportunities that we've covered today for your children and your uh, grandchildren, and beyond that as well. Um, strategies for building generational wealth include obviously investing and education, Jim spoke a lot about how much he has put into his own education. Um, so yeah, invest in education, have uh, the financial markets like uh, property and real estate and things and create and preserve the assets that you put into your financial vehicles. And that way you can be um, really um, ensured that for the future, they're gonna be there for the generations, generations to come. Maximize your tax benefits, avoid the debt, um, and uh, it's crucial for building generational wealth that you do all these things. And hopefully that what we've covered today has given some uh, some of you a really good insight into what building generational wealth is. As we said, obviously, some aspects like the uh, trusts and, and things like that as well, we don't have all the answers and it's, it's, still, a, it's still an educational thing for even Jim himself and, and of course, and, and of course me. Anybody that has any information on trusts and things, that would be quite interesting. Um, but as for today's show, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Um, any questions, jump into comments. You can also come to me direct. And we will be back next Monday, 12.30 as usual, for the verification show. And I'll catch you all then. All right, guys. See you later.